Welcome everyone, my name is Michael. Um, I'm going to give you a brief history uh, about uh, some uh, New Orleans brick. Um, local brick has been the number one choice for builders here in New Orleans since uh, early French and uh, colonial times. Uh, it's the same, it's both the same characteristics and the composition of these bricks that give it both the charm that we all come to know and love and also that's, that's correct, and also um, the same, very same challenges that we face every day, both as building owners and professionals. Uh, before European and American settlers came and imported building materials, uh, such as uh, stone, gravel, and metal, uh, all we had to work with here locally, uh, our raw materials for building were oysters, clay, and sand. And while, yes, it's true, we also had cypress and pine, which eventually became the framework for most of the buildings here in New Orleans and for the flooring as well. It was the oysters that were burned to use for our lime, which makes our mortar and our stucco and our plaster. And it was the clay that could be molded in kilns and burned, which provided us with the bricks that we now know and see here today. Now, the two types of bricks that you'll see most often here in New Orleans are the soft red brick and the harder tan brick. Both bricks are considerably softer than most bricks produced at around the same time uh, in the United States. Uh, the theory is that the clay that we had to work with here locally um, was considered much softer as well as the lower temperatures in the kilns that were produced here at that time. Now, the soft red brick are prone to cracking and crumbling and therefore at some point it was realized that it would take extra care to maintain these bricks and once the builders figured that out they actually were able to build load bearing walls like you see here with these very same bricks with a lime based mortar which is a softer mortar and is more permeable. Now once these buildings were erected with the soft red brick more times than not they were stuccoed or plastered, which at the time was believed to protect the bricks from weather elements and wear and tear. It was believed that the combination of these soft red bricks, the lime-based mortar, and this particular stucco were the three compatible materials with comparable strength and permeability that would provide for longevity. Let's see. Soft red bricks crumble easily. So therefore, we use a lime-based mortar because the relationship between the lime-based mortar and the brick is so that the soft brick, the, br the lime must be softer than the soft red brick. The lime-based mortar being permeable bears the brunt and the burden of the everyday wear and tear that the soft red brick goes through. And so there's a lesson to be learned there somewhere between the relationship between the soft red brick and the mortar. So as we look around in this particular courtyard here today, it is obvious that some work has been done um, over the course of the years. Uh, I know the current building owners have this building since the year 1987. And while I don't know what upgrades or maintenance that they've done to the building before, you can see that there's been a variety of things done to this building. There has been some tuck pointing that's been done. There was once an opening here that was now filled in with some hard tan bricks and some soft red bricks as well as some St. Louis bricks, which is not terribly common in this area. More on the residential side of the quarter is where you'll find a lot of these St. Louis bricks. You'll also notice a variation in the mortar color and the mortar style. Unfortunately, some of the work that's been done in here was done with historically inappropriate mortar. And what I mean by that is it was not the lime-based mortar that was intended for these particular bricks. Um, sometime in the 20th century, um, Portland was introduced as the primary binding agent for masonry and mortar cement. Now the problem with Portland is, is that while it is stronger and harder and impermeable to water, um, it's harder than most of the bricks here. And the problem with that is when your mortar, as we stated earlier, is harder than your brick, oftentimes it promotes cracking, structural fractures, stress fractures, which can definitely cause to um, 
the st instability in the buildings. And even more so, when you have a mortar joint that is impermeable to water, the water tends to migrate and the salt tends to migrate to the face of the brick. And it causes a puff pastry effect that we know as efflorescence. And if you look around, uh, there's lots of places in the French Quarter where you'll see interior and exterior brick where you can just touch the face of the brick and it will crumble off. And more times than not, that is the effects of the salt in the water being brought out to the face of the brick. One thing that I think people don't realize about this particular brick is that they are organic materials, born of clay, and air needs to pass through them on a regular basis. So oftentimes we have issues with moisture being trapped into the building. Now sometimes the moisture comes from above and sometimes the moisture comes from below. Um, this particular building, as you can see by looking up at the wall, from the bottom up, it doesn't appear to be any particular dark discoloration from the ground up. Now what that tells you is that even though the water table below is awfully close and we couldn't really be much closer to the river that we are, that the drainage in this particular courtyard is doing its job. Uh, whether it's the runoff that runs particular into the drains here or the system below that's functioning properly definitely is lending itself to not having a water issue from the ground up. Also, if you take a look here at the base of this building here, you'll notice a concrete base on the bottom here. You'll also notice some holes in the building here. Oftentimes, when we are doing demo on a wall, when we get down to the foundation, what we'll find is what at one time was sort of, uh, I guess, a layman's vapor barrier. So uh, you'll be taking apart the base of a wall to do a major repair down to its foundation, and you'll find Canadian slate within the lower joints or two. Now it might come to you as a surprise and you may even you know, nick your knuckle or skin or bleed for the rest of the day. But um, what you're finding is at that time was when they realized that the water table being so close caused issues. And so that was their way of preventing the water table from affecting the rest of the masonry uh, structure. So what can we do as property owners? Number one, and we'll get to what we can do as professionals afterwards. But as property owners, we need to understand that we live in a unique place. Um, it, going back to the elements that uh, created these, uh, that the bricks and mortar that we have here, to the uh, rising humidity on a daily basis, to the rainy season that we have here for months on end, uh, to the ever shifting and changing foundation large commercial vehicles that drive down our streets every day that this city was never intended to occupy. You have to, you have to first of all, understand that these are challenges that we have to face on a daily basis. The good news is, is that when erected properly, your masonry building does not actually require a whole lot of maintenance. In fact, most historical experts would tell you that you really shouldn't even go outside and scrub down the exterior of your building. The mineral deposits in that water are actually doing more harm to your building than not. So even with the general cleaning and maintenance, you would do it on an as-needed basis. And it would be as simple, it's really, really simple where just a deck brush, much like this, as long as it's not uh, steel bristle or metal bristle, you don't want to do that. You don't want to deface the brick and you don't want to leave rust on the face of the building. But really easily, deck brush just like this with a stick for the hard to reach places and a little bit of elbow grease and a five gallon bucket of warm water with a couple of capsules of some very gentle detergent or even vinegar is all you need to maintain the exterior of your masonry building as far as washing and cleaning and beautifying the building and it's done on a, on a very very as needed basis but there are other elements involved for example sinking foundations, ever moving foundations in this city. If you look to my right and to your left in this corner here, there's some evidence of some sinking in the corner of this building. There are some stress fractures that we see have been patched to the lower right hand side of this window that you'll notice there. And if you follow down this galvanized pipe here, you can see in the lower right hand corner that there's a stress fracture that shows some structural separation there. So, how did this happen and what are the effects of this? Well, how did it happen? More likely than not, it could be the shifting foundations from all the reasons that I've explained to you already. Um, also, it could be 
if, if any of you are familiar with uh, sewage and water issues that we have down here, there's plenty of water that seeps uh, below grade underneath these buildings that also really adds to the same problem that we're having here in the lawns. What does this do? Well, structural separation, aside from as bad as it sounds, the separation of the structure, also allows for voids and space in the building for moisture to collect. And once the moisture collects inside the building, you are inviting things like vegetation that you see here that grows in these buildings. So cracks, spaces, hairline fractures in the building allows water to come in there. Water gives life to these organic materials that are inside of these bricks. And while you could argue that sometimes these fern-like um, greenery that's growing outside of the building or the beautification of cat's claw or ivy definitely adds um, an element of power to the building and I would agree with you but it is detrimental to the life of the building it expands in between the walls and it forces the brick outward and I've definitely seen them take walls and buildings down before so what can we do as professionals well once you become a responsible building owner property owner and you're looking outside your building on a regular basis the first thing that you need to do when you see some of these signs is all licensed professionals you're going to want somebody who's uh, approved by, mostly by the BCC for uh, historical masonry. And you're going to need to do some homework. You're going to need to go ahead and look into some references. Number one, do yourself a favor. Um, you're going to, you know, of course, everyone has a budget and we all have to be price savvy, but I think it's important to get references. I think it's important to when, if you ask your uh, potential contractor, <coughs> what he's worked on in the last several months, I think it's important to get out of the house and go ahead and take a look at that work that he's done. Um, I think it's also important to understand that um, what we do here in the French Quarter is different than probably what we do in most cities in the United States. And we also, we preserve and we restore. And I think it's important that the work itself really lends itself to the character that the French Quarter has and we'd like to maintain that specific character. You don't want to look at a building and tell that there's been some massive patchwork done here and you see uh, what we call buck joints where the buildings have got uh, repaired where it's one up against each other and they haven't been structurally tied into each other and they're using all different sorts of different brick and different types of mortar. Those are things that you, know, you can blame it on your contractor, but as a building owner, I think it's it's your responsibility to go ahead and do the homework and make sure that that thing that, that doesn't happen to you. What else you could do um, as a building owner before you call your professional is we could look for ways that water is entering your property, which is the number one thing. It's the number one foe of your otherwise indestructible masonry wall. So if you took particular on this building, and this is the property we have in front of us, and you look upward, you can see that there's some discoloration underneath these uh, balcony legs. You unfortunately you probably can't see at the very top, but when we looked at the building for the first time, uh, we can see some streaking down of some discoloration and staining of the brick maybe above that open window there with the air conditioner and to the far right of that. That is a direct result of a leak that's somewhere in the building that actually is um, not because of your masonry wall. It's actually not a masonry issue, but it's a roofing issue, or it's a drip edge issue, or it's an improperly hung gutter issue, or a gutter that hasn't been cleaned issue. And that water is now being trapped and is inside or between your masonry walls and doesn't have a place to escape. So that's something that you need to get on as a homeowner. You see voids in the building, you see places that water to get, can get into the building. That's your obligation to call your qualified professional. Um, by show of hands here, how many of you have been in a beautiful French Quarter apartment or condo or a building and you walk inside the place and the air is heavy and it's difficult to breathe and it smells like there must be water damage or something in this place? Let's see, I see a few of you have your hands up. That's a very common thing. Why does that happen? Like I explained earlier, bricks are organic. They are permeable and not only do they need moisture to pass through, but they need air to pass through these buildings. What have you seen when you're inside some of these buildings? You've seen a painted brick wall. So the inside of the, of the building is painted, but the outside is not painted. Okay, well maybe it seemed like a good idea at the time. Interior brick is hard to maintain. 
it's dusty um, and uh, it, you know, they, it flakes, the joints flake out, the bricks flake out, it makes a mess on the floor, you can't put furniture next to it. So what do you do? You put a thick coat of paint on it or you put some polyurethane on the wall, problem solved. Well, problem created is what you've done. So now you have moisture entering this wall from the outside of the building. Even if you don't have a leak problem, even if you don't have a roofing issue, you've got rain, you've got humidity on a daily basis being trapped inside the building and the air doesn't have a place to escape, whether it's from the inside out or the outside in. Similarly speaking, exterior coatings on a building, uh, sealers on a building, while they seem like a great idea and uh, you think it may help shed water from the property and add light to your building, 90% of those products are not made to do that. They are topical products. They sit on the face of the brick. They cause an exterior layer on the brick. And while on a temporary basis you may have solved a very short-term issue, what you've done now is you've trapped moisture inside the wall permanently. And what that will do is that will turn these bricks into a sponge. Once this sponge has absorbed as much water as it possibly can, when it attempts to dry out, it will crumble. And behind your shiny, glossy polyurethane wall will be a patchy, pokey, um, void-filled product. And that's what you don't want. And now you have hundreds of square feet of masonry that not only needs to be tended to, but oftentimes replaced. As of now, the only product that I know of that is a penetrating sealer that can be used effectively and safely on historic brick is a product called Siloxane. Uh, it runs between $40 and $60 a gallon. It takes one or two applications at most, and it lasts about five years. Um, it is not a topical solution. It is a penetrating sealer, and it does allow the bricks to maintain um, the air patches that they need and permeability. Um, so you can look into it. It's, it's not something that we use often, but if you absolutely need to, if you have a lot of water that's hitting your wall and you're willing to maintain that every five years, that is certainly a solution. So, taking again this particular wall into account, we know that at some point this building was stucco and the stucco was removed. So, when we look at the decay and some of the um, areas of this wall that need to be tended to, we have to understand that, well, there was once an inch of stucco on this building. So actually, when you look around and you see some of the faces of this brick, it's really in pretty good shape, believe it or not. Now that stucco had been stuck to this wall for over 100 years, if we know that it came off sometime in the 1930s, and the building was erected sometime in the 1830s. So that just goes to show you that, once again, masonry is really low maintenance. And really, it could last a lifetime, if just with a little bit of TLC. So if we look around at these particular problems here, based on what you've learned so far, we see this dark mortar, it's historically inappropriate. We see the face is blown off of this. Does anyone know what that's called? Spawn. That's right, who said that? That was very good, young lady. Spawn, that's correct. <laughs> that's called spalling. Once the spalling occurs, this is a, okay, this is what happens when the mortar is harder than the brick and the, wall, and the mortar is impermeable to water and the moisture is now being trapped inside the brick. The temperature changes, the, the mortar joint expands and contracts, and in the very few winter cold nights that we have, the face gets blown off of the brick here. And what you have here, is this particular brick is intact, although it's definitely not historically appropriate for this courtyard, is a, it still has a fire burn kiln face. You no longer have that face here. So while the bricks are already exposed to the elements and we're already concerned about the wear and tear and the shreds of everyday life, you have just exceeded I'm sorry, you've just accelerated the rapid erosion on the face of this brick. And all that's going to do is lead into more and more moisture issues, and at some point it will cause a structural issue as well. So that's the number one thing that we can see that's gone wrong in this particular courtyard. There are some areas right here behind this young lady where you can see that this wall has been tuck pointed. Uh, I'd say probably sometimes in the last maybe 30 to 40 years. And while the tuck pointing technique itself, the finishing technique itself, lends itself to being weatherproof, um, we don't know necessarily if this is historically inappropriate mortar, but my guess is that it is. You can see the mortar is beginning to rise to the face of the brick, and the brick is beginning to decay at a terribly different rate, which is also evidence. There you go. You broke it, you bought it. Um, that is also evidence 
um, of the same type of thing that's happening. So, as professional, what can we do? Once we have raked out our mortar joint, and in some cases we're fortunate enough where we can use this raker. It looks a lot like a roller skate. And he's got wheels on it. And this is a masonry nail uh, on the end. You wouldn't want to use this to hammer studs into your, into your wall, but for raking out masonry joints, it does just a fine job. And we can rake this joint out nice and easy. All right, without giving away all of our uh, family secrets. Mm -hmm. But we want to have a clean top and a clean bottom on the edge of our brick and a uniform base for our new mud to stick to. Now, without sticking your tape in there, I can tell you that's about an inch or an inch and a quarter inch deep. You want to be between an inch, an inch and a quarter, and an inch and a half for this to be a structural repair. What we don't want to see is a bunch of mud that's spread onto the face of some decaying mortar, and really all of that's doing is just sticking mud in the face of brick. And that's a, that's a band aid, and that's the least effective band aid that you want. So, once we come in here and we rake out this mortar joint, we come back with our grout bag. At Mason Masters, we use grout bags. We do not use a, a tuck pointer or a slicker. We do not ham to apply the mortar into the bag. Um, while it's a, it's something that's been practiced for hundreds of years, but the spaces between the layers of mortar actually trap pockets of air in between there, and it does not create the same type of bomb. So we use a grout bag, which looks a lot like a pastry bag. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I'm sorry I don't have them with me today. Once we fill the joint with mortar, we take our margin trowel and we cut off the excess mortar. Now, how do you know when to cut off the excess mortar? That's a good question. An experienced mason who is a mud man and not a bricklayer or a block guy or a stucco guy will know when to cut off the excess mortar on your, on your masonry. How do we do that? Well, when it's thumbprint or fingerprint ready. When you can stick your fingerprint or your thumbprint in the mortar and make an impression without smearing the mud on the face of the brick that's when it's time to cut off your excess mortar. And now what you would have is a flush mortar joint, which is very similar to these, which is historically inappropriate. But the most important tool in the bag is your jointer, okay? This is a concave jointer, okay? Um, this is historical masonry restoration 101 tool right here. This is not what new construction guys use. If you're building a strip mall in Gentilly, this is probably not the tool for you. You would use something that looked a little bit more like a lipstick. But for historical masonry, this is the tool that you need. And what this tool, for starters, okay, in my family, we call this a thumb joiner. Whether or not that's the appropriate term for it or not, for generations in my family, we call this a thumb joiner. Maybe because your thumb fits comfortably in there? Really, I don't know. But that's what we call it in my family. And what this thumb joiner does is, you can see in the spacing here, okay, the concave shape allows you to forcibly push the mortar to the top and the bottom of this joint that we have so carefully made sure are now devoid of mortar before we shoot our mortar in there. So your mortar is flush and you take this tool and it's called a striking tool for a reason, folks. It's not a sliding tool, it's not a rubbing tool, it's a striking tool. And you strike across the face of the brick, forcing the brick, the mortar, to bond to the top and the bottom of this brick, leaving a slightly concave face, which is 100% weatherproof if done correctly. 100% folks. There is another type of joint or a tool that gives you that particular effect. We come back, and I can tell you that not a lot of other people do this. Uh, this is something that my family does specifically. And with a rough brush, we clean. The focus is on the face of the brick. And what that does is it cleans the brick. There's no need for acid wash or any harsh chemicals on the brick. Uh, there's, let's see if we can show some, okay, here's some signs where, you know, we could call this, uh, you know, at the risk of being hypercritical of someone else's work, sloppy. Uh, there's, there's mud on the face of some other bricks here that were cut here, probably with the same tool, but were never struck. So what this does is with a rough brush, we're simply cleaning the face of the brick without putting the bristles of the brush in the mortar itself, okay? Keeping our concave joint intact. And again, this is the family secret. This is what separates what Mason Masters does. It's different than any other historical Mason company in the city, I guarantee. As we come back with a slick, long bristle brush. And we take that slick, long bristle brush and we'll be fluff the joints out. We gently touch the joints 
from side to side. And what it does is it does not disturb the concave shape that you learned to make uh, the first time you laid a brick. You certainly don't want to do that. All of your finishes when you go to masonry school, when you pick up a masonry book, is a tool finish, not a brush finish. But with this particular long brush with a slick, shiny, if you want to pass it around and touch it, you start. Yeah, there you go, sir. Okay, you want to. It's, it's got a much, it's a much softer, slicker face than say something that's real rough like this particular brush here would be. And what that does is, my cousin used to tell me is that it ages the brick 20 years. Obviously it doesn't age the brick 20 years, but it provides a look like it's always been there, like the work has been done say 20 years ago. And literally 30, 40 days down the line, I guarantee you, you can never tell that the work has ever been done in the building at all. That's the goal, that's the goal with my company, that's the goal with my crew, that was the goal with my family, is to make sure that the work was seamless and that you couldn't tell that there was ever work, any work ever done anywhere. So, in a nutshell, the onus and the responsibility starts with you as the property owner. Um, I know it sounds like just the, the most basic principles, but take a look at your building. You, bought the building, you love the building, you have a, you're making money with the building, you have a rental, you have a business downstairs, whatever the case may be, it starts with you. It starts with maintaining your roof. It starts with checking on your drip edge. It starts with cleaning your gutters. And all of those things will prevent water from entering your building and um, creating a situation where you're not going to disturb the masonry structure. If you've got issues with your masonry wall and you neglect it, you've got issues inside your home. If you see your floor in your beautiful living room is running down in one in one place or the other, um, I could almost guarantee you without being in your house that you have a sinking masonry problem. So there are telltale signs that you absolutely can't avoid as building owners, property owners, and homeowners. If you're looking at the top of your window and suddenly the right side of your window is three or four inches out of square from the left side of your window, you can't tell me that you don't know that there's a problem in your home. And uh, I'm here to tell you that um, my family's been working here since 1968. I took over the family business over 20 years ago. And with the exception of some of my best clients who are uh, business owners um, in this neighborhood that you would know by name, who absolutely are on top of it and they, they want their buildings to be in perfect working order. They don't care how much it costs. It's a regular masonry maintenance type of thing. Most people wait till it's too late. Most people wait till the water's entering inside the building. Most people wait till it stinks something so terrible in the building that they can't stay there for weeks at a time and, and they have to stay at a friend's house and you have to go ahead and do your job. And at that point, it's not just a brick wall. It's not just the interior plaster. It's the stuff. It's the it's the sheetrock on the ceiling. It's the rot on the window sills. Now you've got the mason. Now you've got the sheetrock guy. Now you've got the carpenter. Thing. So it really I can't stress this enough. Um, but if there's an actual moral to the story, is that it's really up to you as the building owner and the property owner. Does anybody have any questions? How do you deal with Portland cement with all that deal? How do you what, sir? How do you deal with it? Like okay, so I believe the question is, if the wall has been repaired with uh, historically inappropriate water, is this something you can do? Well, there is. Um, in a situation like this, we have historically inappropriate mortar here, and the damage has already been done to this brick. You can see that the rapid erosion is there, the brick is flaking out, and really it's time to, it's time to repair this section of the wall. Now, right now, there isn't a serious structural issue, because you would see what we, I would call a bellying or bowing or structural separation. But a qualified mason would come in here with a power tool, um, whether it be a uh, seven inch grinder or a demo saw with a diamond blade that's very specifically made to cut through this section of the building. And what I would do is I would be able to actually cut this entire section of the building out, removing as many of the bricks as I could by hand once we scored the building, reusing whatever is possible, which there definitely are some reusable bricks here. And folks, let me just tell you that 90% of what we do, um, you know, we, we preserve, we restore, but it's we salvage. That's what we do. And that's the most important thing to remember here. We, we are, you know, in this town, the way we get bricks to repair your building, the way we find these soft red bricks, the way we get these hard tan bricks, is we buy them used. And my shop is filled with pallets, thousands of soft red brick, hard brick, hard brick um, Pennsylvania flagstone, 
as far as the eye can see. Old Chicago brick, we salvage brick. That's what we do. Uh, we like to boast that we have a 75% salvage rate when we work on any project. And I can tell you that I've taken a, a section of a building that's over 2,000 bricks and have maybe broken one or two at a time. So of course that's the best case scenario, but you know, that's what you want to talk about most. Um, so that's what we would do. We would cut the section of the brick out. In some cases where the brick hasn't actually uh, begun to decay, we can actually just cut the joints out. So I can tell you that you know, an inch and a half with a you know, four and a half inch diamond blade would easily cut this joint out. Now we want to cut the joint out. We don't want to grind the joint out. <coughs> they definitely make products with diamond blades that are half inch and five eighths inch that are made specifically to fit inside the joint here. But we want to preserve the history. And we don't want to deface the brick and we don't want to make this joint any larger than it needs to be because that's not our job. That's not our goal. Uh, we're not here to just, you know, throw caution to the wind and wreak havoc. We're here to actually try to maintain some level of, uh, well, we want to actually keep it as close to accurate as we humanly possibly can. So that's what I would do. I would come in here and I would cut these joints out and then I'd use the same tuck pointing technique, the same brush and the same joiner as, uh, as I showed you before and we would have it all blend in and look the same. And in cases like these, these bricks would also, they need to come out. They need to be cut out of this building safely in this particular case here, we know we can cut this section of the wall out wide. Anybody know what this is called? Anybody? Nobody from the BCC? Okay, this is a header course. So what this header course does is it ties in this brick wall to the brick wall behind it. Okay, so oftentimes in this running bond, you should have a header course every five or six courses. So let's say we have one, two, three, we got four courses here. One, two, three, we got four courses here. Okay, so for in this particular building, every four courses of this wall is tied, structurally tied in to the wall behind it, which is a terrific thing. You don't want to have a bunch of freestanding structures that can move in multiple directions, especially with the ever-changing foundation, which we touched upon earlier. So, this particular header course right here tells me that I can take out this section of the wall and this brick is supporting the section above it, which is how we are able to take out Sometimes we take out on a city block the entire bottom level of a building, but we know that the rest of the wall is being supported by the header course above. Anyone else? Just kind of this little plant at the bottom. The, this, yeah, this here? Like okay, that? so that is what we touched upon before. Is a, okay, it's, it's a, it looks like it's a elevated footing. I can tell you for sure that this part of this concrete slab definitely goes below grade, but what it is is a vapor barrier. Okay, so the permeability of this um, concrete base is gonna be different than the soft red brick. Had this soft red brick been below grade and closer to the water table, we would have found what I described to you earlier as a Canadian slate in the joint, and that would have acted as your vapor barrier. But in this particular case, this is acting as your vapor barrier between the brick and the water table. Okay, so these little holes, more likely than not, at some point, and I can't say for sure, but may have been to treat a termite issue. Termites live within brick walls, believe it or not. People think that concrete and brick are um, impervious to termite, but it's not true. So when you have a flaky face on a brick like this, when you have a, a uh, bleeding mortar joint like this, and it's in between your walls, you're doing the termites a favor. They are subterranean insects. When you see them on the face of your wooden structure, you see mud trails, correct? You know why? Okay, because they need to throw the dirt and the mud over their back in order to be on the exterior of the surface because most termites are subterranean insects. So what you've done is you've given them a playpen. You've given them an area where they don't have to work, they don't have to dig, uh, they don't have to chew, they basically just roaming through the dust in between the walls. And so that will get into the furred out wall and the framework of your, of your wood that's 300 years old inside this building that's been more likely sucking moisture for however many years, and that's just what they need. Yes, sir? Where do the materials come from for the local brick? Where do they come from today? No, no. Uh, in the old days, where do the materials The base of the Mississippi River. That's where you'd find the collection of both the clay and the oyster shells. <laughs> today, they don't make these bricks. They're some of these bricks are over 300 years old. They're pre-Civil War bricks. You cannot get a soft red brick unless a building comes down. 
And there are several places around town uh, that have demo companies and sell used bricks, like uh, Masonry Products, shameless plug to them, um, on uh, North Alexander and uh, Conti, which is where I get, uh, I'd say, the large majority of my historic brick. Uh, I also use a couple of brick brokers in town, but uh, we won't mention them. You can do the work with uh, I have not been uh, hired or contracted to do any work here at all. The good people at the BCC chose this place um, as an example just to, for us to go over um, some of the uh, lingering effects of the uh, environmental conditions that we have here in the French Quarter, um, on what it is that it does, and what can be done to improve and maintain your you know, average masonry. If your house is not brick, would you have a brick to make? What you said about paint? I'm sorry, one more time? You have an interior chimney that's brick, but your house exterior is not. Mm -hmm. Is it still bad to paint brick? Well, there are some uh, painting products that are masonry paints that are um, uh, a little bit better for the air and the moisture to pass through. Uh, your specialty guy at Sherman Williams could probably tell you a little bit more about that than I can. But um, some brick are safer to paint than others. Yes? How do you feel about the mineral stains and lime wash? Okay, mineral stains can be washed off the brick with water. Just a little bit of warm water and some vinegar and a couple of half fills or any gentle detergent can be washed off with mineral stains. Now, I'm talking about a finish that is a mineral stain similar to lime wash. How do I feel about it? I think it's a personal aesthetic. Um, I think lime wash is, is, a, is a product that's pretty safe. It's not something that I do. Um, I have done uh, something more along the lines of like a, a Mexican sack rub finish, which is similar to that, where we would scrape the mortar on like stucco, very similarly, but a little bit thinner. And we take a, we take a wet burlap sack and we rub it into the brick and we let that set up as well. We come back with a dry burlap sack and it sort of does a similar effect with the lime wash, but um, it's more of a patina effect, where you see some some of the edges in the shape on the bricks, and some of them that you don't. I think, are you available to see your questions? Sure. Um, I'm just wanted to give you a thank you. Oh, well, that's very nice. Which is lovely. And we thank you all for coming, and we hope you found it as valuable. Thank you.